Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Irish Illustrated Insider. I'm Tim Priest with Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated. John Bryce is with us from the Football Scoop and Pete Sampson from The Athletic. We are a couple days removed from Notre Dame's 23-13 victory over Texas A&M. Notre Dame uh, was in a slugfest for most of the day. Both offenses struggled, but Notre Dame scores 10 points in the last two minutes of the game to take the victory home to South Bend out of College Station. Guys, jump in, T.O. Um, all that matter was a, was a victory. I think Notre Dame played when you consider the circumstances, the environment, the temperature, the weather, everything that went with it. Notre Dame handled the elements pretty darn well. It's a, it's that one argument I've, I've always had for, obviously you have to judge the opponents by how they finish the season. But no matter how Texas a and finishes the season, that was a tough situation that Notre Dame encountered. It's it's that variable that you can't account for, um, and that's why rankings are so subjective. But somebody on our board said, "Is this going to be a big win when they have six when they have six or seven wins?" Well, how big of a loss would it be if a And M at that point had seven or eight only seven or eight wins? That this was absolutely the biggest game to open a season since Michigan, 2018, because Notre Dame will now be the best team on the schedule every game this year, I think. I think they were going into this game, too. I'm not sure they were for that Michigan game. This is the type of thing you had to not lose. Can I just say it that way? You had to, you had to, you had to get Marcus yeah. Freeman this win. John? Yeah, and Marcus, Marcus Freeman had to get this win, too. I mean, it, it goes both ways. And, and Marcus Freeman did, and um, the coaching staff delivered. I've said that. Um, noted that over the weekend, noted it again on the Football Scoop podcast. I think that um, Notre Dame won the headset matchup. I think Notre Dame got Mike Elko uh, uncomfortable, and I think that this was absolutely a game where Notre Dame had to win it. The NFL scouts uh, don't care as much about wins and losses on a college team, but they care about who they're scouting. They scouted a hell of a lot of Texas A&M players Saturday night. Uh, they were scouting them pregame. They were scouting them in game. We saw that. We know there's a lot of NFL talent on the AM roster. AM's got a grueling schedule. Um, and we'll know more about AM in two weeks when it goes to Florida and plays in the swamp uh, as Billy Napier's fighting for his life to keep his job down in Gainesville. We'll have a much better barometer of what team Texas AM is at that time. If Connor Wegman is better than what Notre Dame made him look on Saturday night, or if that's more of who Connor Wegman is going to be. But um, Notre Dame absolutely had to have this game as the year three program uh, against the year one program. I'd say of the things that I thought were, were going to happen, one of them was Al Golden eating Colin Klein's lunch. That 100% occurred. Um, Colin Klein had no answers for what Al Golden was trying to do or Notre Dame was doing defensively. I would just say, like, in terms of a, a point of comparison with the SEC, I would look at Missouri, LSU, Texas. Those teams are going to be fighting for at-large bids. They all go to Kyle Field. So it's a pretty apples-to-apples -apples comparison um, in terms of Notre Dame's wins versus whatever results happen um, to those Three other schools, I wouldn't expect all three to beat Texas A&M. Um, so it's a good point of comparison with the SEC for Notre Dame uh, for November and early December when people are trying to split hairs and figure out who goes where in, in the rankings. Notre Dame held Texas A&M's offense to 246 yards total, total offense. Uh, as you pointed out, JB, Connor Wigman was made to look awful, 12 of 30 uh, two interceptions in the first half. Notre Dame's uh, outstanding safeties, the outstanding safety tandem back there, and uh, Don Schuler is certainly headed in the same direction as Xavier Watts is. And uh, you know, to hold, I mean, I think I think Connor Wegman, Wegman is a he's a good quarterback. He's going to be a good quarterback. And and as you said, John, I, I they made him look bad. That that was a really really bad performance. Um, you know he I. The accuracy that we saw him throw with prior to to uh, to Saturday he wasn't anywhere close to that. And again, that's a trademark of of L Golden defenses. The 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 low average per pass attempt. Uh, his was uh, three point three, which is just outrageously poor. And uh, it gave Notre Dame's offense a chance to, uh, you know, after three and a half quarters to still have some time to to make some hay offensively, and they did that. I think our bubble knew that uh, you mentioned a safety duo. I thought the safety trio played well too with Rod Hurd when he was in there yep. 
<clears throat> our bubble knew that secondary was going to win was going to be way better than Texas A&M's passing game. I didn't know it was going to be astronomically better like this, where it was just, I mean, they were abysmal versus Notre Dame. And two things can be true. Notre Dame's defense, their secondary was the reason, but Connor Wigman missed throws too. Now you get flustered when you have a bad start, so you get flustered when guys are all over in and when you're throwing up, as Priester pointed out earlier on his analysis. But the weirdest analysis I heard was Notre Dame's secondary could be vulnerable here. That's just like not putting on a game. I mean, that is that was pregame ESPN. That's insanity. There was no way this secondary would be vulnerable. I guess we got to watch Brom and Louisville to find out when they're going to be vulnerable until possibly out of USC, and it's still not vulnerable. Yeah, it's the best part of the team. Yeah, it, it was. That was the differentiator. Yeah. The defensive line at AM is great. The defensive line of Notre Dame is great. The back end of Notre Dame is phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, but I, I guess I can sort of look at it from like, okay, you got to see Christian Gray do it in a game. You got to see a Don Schuler do it in a game. Well, that happened. So it's over and done with. Um, I thought both of those guys were outstanding. Um, and really, a lot of, a lot of first time uh, key players. Bowen, Osbury, KVA, uh, I thought played well. And that's like, I don't, not, not all of them did, but like, especially on defense, that was a really locked in performance from a defense that if you're going to play ball control, you really got to be perfect and not misfit runs. And that's just, it's hard to do that a hundred percent of the time or at the percentage that Notre Dame demanded its defense do it. So I think it's, it's worth pointing out that Notre Dame's defense did the the little every down stuff incredibly well on Saturday night. I think that's a, a great point, Pete. And I think um, when we talk about how well those guys playing major roles for the first time ever uh, played, especially a guy like uh, Adon Schuler, I think it, it makes me remember uh, Al Golden and Mike, Max Bola talking in the preseason about how they had installed the defense four times over before they ever started camp. They went through four separate – installation processes of the entire defensive package so that by the time the guys got to camp they're executing it and knowing what to do and getting more and more confident with every single rep that they got in and I thought you saw guys that very clearly knew their assignments on Saturday in a very difficult environment and playing in that kind of big game magnitude for the first time in their careers. Riley Leonard completes 18 of 30 for a relatively modest 158 yards. There was not a downfield passing game. The longest reception was the 20 yard, the very clutch 20 yarder by Bo Collins along the sideline in what proved to be the game winning touchdown drive. Uh, but, you know, in the fourth quarter, guys, um, it was Riley Leonard's legs that did a lot of the, 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 the quality work for Notre Dame's offense, really kept drives. Moving the eight play 85 yard drive was just absolutely clutch and came at the right time. And, you know, I mentioned this in the, in the, in the tail of the tape, but that eight play 80 yard drive may have still happened, but it would have been pushed back a little bit. Had the pass to, uh, to levy on Moss where we thought he caught it along the sideline for a first down, but he was so concerned about making the catch that he didn't. Uh, and maybe that's a running back, not a receiver uh, doing something like that, but didn't reach out to get the first down, they had a 61 yard punt. And that's when Notre Dame started their eight play 85 yard drive. Watching that back, Tim, I thought of Ohio state two years ago when Mayan Williams made the catch and CJ Stroud looked like Superman on the throw on third and 12. And we talked to Al golden after he's like, I mean, quarterback and the running back made a play. We, we had him on the run. You're not facing that. You're just, we we've talked, you're not facing that this year. That's those are special. CJ Stroud's a special player. Caleb Williams is a special player. There might be a special player like that. Zachariah Branch might be a special player. He might do something along those lines uh, when they play the Irish. But I uh, I don't know. I Just from watching Riley Leonard at Duke, I had a feeling they were going to drive down and win the game. I wouldn't have had that feeling last year. I wouldn't have had that feeling the year before. Uh, it was because it, it, it's odd to have it when you're not moving the ball at all under Riley Leonard. But I felt that you know, he will get them down the field. That's where the grit and toughness comes into play a little bit more than the accuracy where Pete and I are watching in the red zone. We're like, did love turn the wrong way or did he throw that poorly? Could he have, could he have fixed that ball in there to Devin Ford or high to Mitch Evans? Or was that a bad throw that will be played out in the next few weeks. If Riley Leonard doesn't make the throws against Northern Illinois and Purdue, especially then there could be some concern. Other than that, he's just a winner and he will drive them down the field to beat Northern Illinois. If he has to like Jack Cohn did. John, what are your I thoughts just, on Riley Leonard's performance? 
I mean, I just thought. Oh, sorry. I was just saying. I thought they did a. They asked him not to make that throw to Ford. Essentially, that you're talking about. Don't um, make that mistake. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no. A, there's I agree. A corner, there's a corner squat in the in the end yeah. zone. You got to throw across your body or lead him into. I wanted um, it to Leonard, not to Ford. I mean, not Leonard. Um, Mitchell, Mitchell Evans. Evans. I keep saying Leonard. Yeah, no, Mitchell Evans going across. I think I called it the Dwight Clark throw to you, Peter. But you have to. I, yeah. You know, I thought it was a prudent decision, though. It's a six-three game, and you cannot afford to go. Uh, to end that series without tying the game. Uh, but I agree with you, Pete. And that was something we said at the time, something I wrote today that having rewatched the game, that it, he was just trying to make a prudent decision and not make a mistake. And, uh, you know, I you still tie the game and, uh, and, uh, and, and you just don't want to come away from that series still trailing. And, yeah. and, and let me just, I'm sorry, John, let me just say, Tim, you made a point about Jeremiah Love. I thought that was love. I mean that that was a that that was a fa- a fade situation. It was an inexperienced pass route runner turning it in instead of looking to the corner. Yeah, and I I thought look, Riley Leonard played a full college football game for the first time in eleven months. Um, he, sure he had some rust, but he didn't have any debilitating rust. Um, and you go into that environment and you don't turn the football over behind an offensive line that entered the game with six career starts, as we've all noted, uh, is significant work by Riley Leonard. I would not call him a game manager because he was dynamic in moments that they needed him to be dynamic. And he was certainly dynamic with his leadership and his sheer will to help Notre Dame win that football game. Well, yeah, what was that? I, Go ahead, Pete. I was just going to say the, it's worth noting they had three passes of 15 yards or more down the field, which tied for the third fewest in a Notre Dame game since 2019. Um, the game plan was to get the, like, I know people want to see the ball push vertically a little bit more. The game plan was to not do that, um, which I thought was smart considering the offensive line was what it was. Um, we have like at the athletic, we have access to something called true media, which is kind of PFF on roids, but, um, 2.18 seconds, uh, snap to throw average, which was the shortest snap to throw average in a Notre Dame football game since they started tracking that in 2019. So, Snap the ball, get it out. Snap the ball, get it out. Snap the ball, get it out. I thought it was just when we talk about a complimentary game plan, sometimes we think that means offense and defense. I think in this instance, it was offense coordinator and offensive line. I got to call the game to help out my offensive line. Quarterback needs to get the ball out to help out his offensive line. I thought they did a really nice job of working all that together. Uh, you know, I would agree with that, Pete. And I, you know, I think too often we look at, okay, well, uh, so they did this. So that means they're not going to do it the next ensuing games uh, you, you try to win the game one at a time and that's exactly what Marcus Freeman had on his mind having said that this was the length of the 18 completions 3 8 4 10 12 14 minus 2 11 8 6 and that was a jet sweep shovel 0 9 6 11 10 9 9 20 and and again I get it winning the football game uh, was the only thing that mattered on Saturday. It's just something that's going to have to be, it's going to have to be better at times as, as you move forward. Now I asked Marcus Freeman about, uh, maybe I could have phrased it a little bit better, but I, you know, I mean, the deep ball is not Riley Leonard's the best aspect of his game. And I asked him how you balance that with his strengths. And, and he wanted to say that he feels like, Riley Leonard can do that. And I realize that this probably wasn't the matchup to do it, but there are, there are matchups coming up certainly down the road where, um, you know, Riley Leonard won't necessarily be able to just bail Notre Dame out with his feet. He's going to have to throw the ball downfield. So it'll be interesting to see that the development of that part of their offense. I think uh, the 20 yarder you mentioned could have become negative 15 really fast too. Had the official been paying attention. I don't, I can't believe that happened that they got away with it. That is I, a I, that is the textbook definition of a personal foul penalty. Yeah, Bo Collins I, I, shoving the guy in the back is a de- after catching the ball right in front of the official. Well, is yeah, a and I don't, I don't every under- single time. I don't understand why he did it. Unless I don't either. Some some uh, some talk going on between them, but keep yeah, talking, they, keep talking they, all you want. <laughs> they were they were very fortunate because that that could have been a, a obviously that could have been a drive ender or or something that really inhibited it. At no point. Like going into the fourth quarter, if we would have said, yeah, Notre Dame's going to run for 198 yards in this game, you wouldn't have believed it. But Notre Dame's fourth quarter, some long runs by Jeremiah Love and 
and Jadari and Price. I thought they were a good complement to one another. I still kind of stand by the notion that, no, I do stand by the notion that Jadari and Price is a more accomplished running back. That doesn't mean you give less touches to uh, Jeremiah Love. I thought Jeremiah Love, when you, when you look at the tape, I thought he started very slowly, he made some poor uh, run choices, paths that he chose to go uh, in in the wrong direction. But he, he got up to the speed of the game. And then, like you saw both of them, the speed that they possess, the 47-yard touchdown run when Jadarian Price kicked it outside, and then the 29-yarder when Jeremiah Love went uh, uh, down the sideline. What a, I mean, a big, long, beautiful, powerful stride down the sideline. You can see what this duo can do for Notre Dame carrying the football this year. It was a great game for the run game because the running backs are really talented, not because their offensive line blocked it all that well. Um, sometimes you're going to have to have games like that where you just need elite athletes to go out and make two guys miss on a play. Um, and that happened. I was certain to happen on Price's TD run, uh, loves TD run. I don't think there's a lot of running backs that can, that wasn't really a hole that he hit. I mean, it was just like a, a sliver of space and somehow he got incredibly skinny and, and, jumped through it it was that was just really impressive not a lot of not a lot of running backs to do that I think somebody had mentioned to me like if you had Audric Estime this the running game might not have done anything um or a lot less I I don't necessarily disagree because like Audric any if you get a blocked right for Estime boom like he can plow some people like they they needed running backs to be like elite athletes on Saturday night and they got enough of it from price and love what love did a great job of on that specific run you're referring to pete is he was right on the back of uh i believe it was ashton craig and so when the it was a sliver but he hit it when it was that sliver and then you know the athleticism took over pete that's an interesting point because i just took a quick look and love and price had 10 and six missed tackles forced um respectively. And of course, Price only had seven carries. So I quickly looked and Estime's career high was 11. He did it twice. Navy and Stanford. He had, I think he had and tackles those are, declined. And those yeah, the tackles declined were also involved in Audric Estime. Uh, but I would, my point was, I wonder if most of Audric Estime's were after four steps. That's where the tackles declined and Audric Estime's missed tackles force happened. I think Love and Price are better at making a tackle miss when it's at the line of scrimmage. I don't know how much better if you make a tackles be. How about tackles issued would be under Estime as they yeah. bounce off business of him decisions as well. prompted. <laughs> yes, business decisions involved against under Estime five per game. I'm not sure you have as many this year. JB. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd said going in that I thought if Notre Dame got more than 50 yards on the ground from Riley Leonard and more than 75 yards uh, from scrimmage from Jeremiah Love that it would be uh, a recipe for Notre Dame to win. Particularly, I'd, I'd said, on even though our pregame uh, preview from the field Saturday, I said I felt Notre Dame especially needed to win the first half turnover battle. Now, I thought it was uh, a little bit dicey when Notre Dame won that first half turnover battle and found itself uh, knotted at right. six all, but then uh, you also knew that Notre Dame was getting the ball to come out of uh, halftime, and I think that probably uh, affected how Marcus and, and Mike called uh, the offense in the first half and just sort of the way they felt things out. But the running backs were really good. We've said, like, as good as Audric Estime was, as imposing as he was, I like the sum of these two guys a little bit better. Wrapping up the first segment, let's talk a little bit about the offensive line. Tim, I, I was – I was watching Anthony Knapp a lot, especially through the first half. And I will, I will stand by my comments about him with regard to pass blocking. He was, I mean, you're, you're going to grade him on a curve, obviously, but you really oh, yeah. didn't, need, I mean, but you really did that when it came to pass blocking, you really didn't need the curve because he was outstanding against Nick Scorton. I think there was only one time where he really was beaten by him. Um, Eli Raritan, uh, not so much in his one-on-one -on -one matchup with him. I, I would pull back a little bit on some of the decision-making in the, in the run game. Uh, Knapp made some mistakes, but when you add it all up, you add up Pendleton, um, you know, uh, Emil Wagner as well. And you expect good things from, from Billy Shrouth and Ashton Craig and that hold on Craig that, that eliminated, I think it was a 27 yard run. I'm not sure he really needed to hold, but he was blocking Tory and York, who is a handful in the open field, and he he wrapped his hand around him a little bit. But 
you know, I, 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 the offensive line wasn't great, but it was way better than some of the speculation that was out there, which was natural because you had six career starts. They have 11 now. I'm going to keep a tally of that as they, they move forward with that starting offensive line. But all things considered, they more than held their own and really, really negated Nick Scorton. Yeah, hey, it was funny, Priester, you, you kind of, you saw it live, and I said I pulled the amateur move for the first time in a long time. I was watching Riley Leonard the whole time. You're not supposed to watch the quarterback the whole time you watch a game to get a feel of what's happening down there. But by the way, Pete, we I don't know if you heard this, and John as well, you're a one row above. That was a better view than Notre Dame's view, even though we're high up. I could see everything happening, and I don't know how to explain it. Is it because we're on top of it? It's got to be a little the bit? angle. It's got to be angle the angle. Was great to watch a game, even though we were really high. The... Uh the roof extending out to block the sun for an extra 45 minutes was also really nice. That could be it. Michigan state's still the worst, but Tim, you made great points about nap. He, uh, the whole, the whole key of the offensive line is we did not lead this podcast or incident analysis post game or any of your columns talking about the offensive lines problems. This would have been all about the line, another podcast and another August spent on offensive line. They did a good job. Yeah. I thought pre-snap, I was super impressed. That was where I thought that they were going to have the big, big problems. Um, And they, they didn't, they sort of played through the environment. So I thought that was good Uh, post snap. I mean, I thought the Texas A&M defensive line was better than Notre Dame's offensive line, but they didn't need to win the matchup. They just needed to not get blown out in the matchup. Uh, And they did a really nice job of that too. So I would say, look, if Knapp, Wagner, um, and Pendleton, probably the worst they're ever going to be together because they will get experience from here and they're not going to have Nick Scorton every other week. So it was probably something that you would f- you would feel really good about, especially because you won the game. Um, but yeah, I would I would feel really good about where I was headed as a Notre Dame football player as if, I, if I was any one of those three guys. JB, your thoughts on the offensive line play? Yeah, I think um, we probably should be talking uh... – a little bit more about Joe Rudolph and the job that he did to get that group ready. And, the, and once again, uh, what we've discussed, the way this coaching staff has worked together uh, over the course of camp and having to adjust with the loss to to Charles Jagasa. When I've not gotten to rewatch the the game in its entirety, I've rewatched a great portion of it. Um, and you see Knapp's athleticism, but also the strength and and the hands that they that the coaching staff loves about him and there were times he was able to to get his hands on Scorton or whomever and drive them where he needed or push them away and allow Riley Leonard to step up and make decisions so I just thought for for a first game again I'd said you can't have this line be so bad that there's a catastrophic mistake that turns the tide of the game now there was one catastrophic mistake where Riley Leonard got ear hold that had he not been able to get the ball out so quickly, it would have turned around the game. But that's it. That's one catastrophic, mis- one very bad mistake that was not catastrophic because Riley Leonard was able to get the football out. Otherwise, you can't look at it and say that the line had really any catastrophic moments. It, it stalemated, which is what you needed it to do. There's more to come, but first, because you're a Notre Dame fan, don't miss the chance to see some of our cool videos on YouTube. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook by following Irish Illustrated. All of our social channels are available to you. The more you help us, the more we can do for you. So thanks in advance for following, subscribing, and sharing Irish Illustrated on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up, segment two, burning up the boards. If you're coming to a game this season, you have to check out Game Day Your Way, Notre Dame's tailgate service provider. Game Day offers everything you need, including tailgate gear, catering, and even beverage delivery right to your spot. And their Irish Express transportation from Chicago allows you to tailgate while you travel to their all-inclusive party zone in South Bend. Let Game Day deal with all the hassle so you can focus on the fun. For tailgates, tickets, transportation, and more, visit gamedayyourway.com. Welcome back to segment two, burning up the boards. Our first question from Irish boy one, given all the angst over playing at A&M with the heat noise environment and A&M's talent, especially the defensive line. How did those things measure up to what they actually were? I think it was all legit. I mean, it was, it was very humid. Um, and, and again, I think we said this in instant analysis. I think Notre Dame held up better to the humidity, which is if that isn't a, if that isn't a public service announcement of Lauren Lando and what he's doing, I don't know what is or, or what's not being done at Texas A&M. But, you know, the crowd was was spectacular. We were 
the the press box was sealed so you didn't get the complete feel for it but just the and it, it was similar to Georgia the orchestrated chants and cheers and music and it it I, I mean it was amazing and and more amazing than that was that Notre Dame handled it uh, they handled it not every time yeah no it's it's impossible to handle it every time but when you hear when you hear Nick Saban saying on you know pregame show because he he was Alabama was number one when they lost to AM uh three years ago in that stadium and so he knows as well as anyone and thought Notre Dame would struggle with it all the credit in the world the Marcus Freeman and staff they did a hell of a job preparing for that and executing it when it when it really counted yeah it I was mean, all it was all as advertised um the and I think that if I mean, we think about Georgia, we think about Miami's in its own category. Uh, Michigan in 11, Michigan in 13, uh, maybe Clemson. Tennessee. This was, just... Yeah, Tennessee. Um, that was a minute ago. But, like, the reason this didn't hit the pitch of Georgia or Michigan or Michigan is because Notre Dame won the game. Um, like, I thought that was part of, the, part of the game plan to me was Notre Dame never let the fuse get lit for the stadium to explode. There was just not a moment, like maybe if there was that pick six in the third quarter that just was not, did not happen, but was close. I, like there was not a moment like that for the stadium just to go off. Um, and so I thought Notre Dame did a nice job managing the environment, which was incredibly loud anyway, but just never went insane. And I agree with you, Pete, an easy turning point though, it wasn't. It wasn't something that would get the crowd to go berserk like in a pick six or something like that. But the the easy turning point could have been the second, fourth, and short hold near midfield. But Notre Dame, uh, I mean Texas A&M eventually failed on fourth and eight right after that series. And so I think that's a good point that Notre Dame did not give the crowd the opportunity to be crazy in a sustained way. It was just still kind of hit and miss. Uh, both offenses and over the long haul over the course of three and a half hours that does tame tame things down and it you know it drives at what marcus freeman said today was kind of his motivation uh for his animation in the tunnel there pregame and he wanted his team to know that they were prepared that they had worked uh all summer if not all year for this opportunity and not to get lost in the moment not to get lost in the noise and to to block it out and, and play their game. And you can't say that they entirely blocked it out when there were 11 penalties, but um, only three penalties in the fourth quarter when they won the football game. Uh, very decisive, uh, again, the way that Notre Dame closed the football game out is what's most impressive to me. And, and yeah, the fact that um, Notre Dame withstood the noise and withstood the heat much better than Texas A&M is, I think, is the sign of an, of an ever-maturing program. Next from Panthers, 23-23 of the following guys who got the first significant playing time, whose performance surprised you the most, and who had the biggest impact. He lists Jaden Osbury, Donovan Heinish, Adon Schuler. I just actually read this as somebody else, Bowen. Drake Bowen, KVA, any of the offensive linemen, or Bo Collins. I almost said the other name for Bowen. That's amazing. All these be, I, like, I, I'm not sure I'm... I, I, well, okay. The, JB, you go ahead and start. All right. Um, I'm probably going to go with the Don Schuler. Um, I think we had all talked enough about the camp that he had had on top of the spring that he had had that um, we understood fully why he earned the starting job. But meeting the moment for all the factors we just got through describing uh, is different altogether. And, and Bowen and Osbury hadn't played in those situations really, but they had played. They'd been in in big stadiums and done that and sure Schuler had as well but, but not in that starting role and just um not to that magnitude so to me it's um it's Schuler really impressed with the offensive line what they did honestly we're probably not talking enough about Emil Wagner because we didn't have to talk about Emil Wagner Saturday, Saturday night which I think speaks volumes Tim I was gonna let Pete go since I read the question oh, but uh, I would say I mean, Drake Bowen had a full job in there I, I mean Bowen had his moments where he didn't look great he had the highlight moments Jay Osbury had the nicest highlight right 
Uh, uh, Bo Collins is on this list, but Jaden Osbury knifing through as the weak side linebacker on the boundary and making that tackle is he looked like that was his 45th game. Yeah, uh, he made four stops. I don't know how many snaps did he get. I mean, he didn't get. I, yeah, they're I all they're all in that 30 range, but I, I thought he played well. Uh, Priester, you point out during the game, Heinish. Uh, he got better. Really came I thought on he got a lot better. Got going. Yeah. Yes, he got a lot better as the game went on because we were lamenting Cross not being in there at times in the beginning. Clearly, clearly that was tactical to keep him fresh for the second half um, with Howard Cross, that he he played a lot more in the second half. Biggest impact with the old lineman, but uh, but Schuler's pick. Schuler's pick was a, was a pretty big deal in that game. Yeah. Pete? yeah I would say Schuler, Schuler had the biggest gap between what I had seen in the preseason and what I saw on Saturday. And it's not like we hadn't seen anything from Schuler, but like, I'm not sure we saw that. Um, like I even thought he looked great missing tackles. Like there are a couple of times where he missed tackles, but he was going a million miles an hour, which I thought was a really good thing to have. Um, so I just like, he looked explosive at all times. That was impressive. Um, like Osbury, I remember liking him in the spring a year ago and then maybe not seeing as much of him in the preseason this year. Um, so he he played really well. And then, yeah, I would agree with John that Emil, Emil Wagner of the three real young offensive linemen, I thought Emil Wagner was the best of that group. I. You know, I was the pro- in the prove me camp with Bowen. I thought Bowen re- did a really, really nice job. Um, I, I I had confidence that Anthony Knapp could play well, but against a, a normal defensive end, not a guy yeah. like Nick yeah. Scorton. I mean, he was he was absolutely great in pass protection. Uh, there, I, as I mentioned earlier, there were some things along the way a little bit. Should, Collins looks like he's going to be a you know, four catch a game back shoulder guy that's going to be very difficult to to stop. Um, should I, Pete, I was a little bit higher on Schuler coming out of camp. I we had suggested that he could win the starting job, and he did. Uh, you know, it's I, you know, it's doesn't matter really where we rank these guys. I get the question, of course, but uh, yeah, I mean, you had to go into a tough environment and do some things that that most of us didn't. Most of us didn't think that they. They would, and uh, and they absolutely did that. We have a question from Irish B. What unit impressed you the most? Which unit was most disappointing? I mean, it's either corner or safety. You can choose which one impressed you the most. I guess safety. They had the two picks. Uh, Christian Gray jumping that route is nuts because I'm not sure he should jump. That was just a – that takes so much, so much guts to jump the route on fourth down there because if he catches the ball – they're still not going to go the next 70 yards on fourth and two, but that right. just shows what he's going to be. Um, in my previews I wrote for a and I mentioned, you know, Christian Gray is the, he's the best player you don't know, but Benjamin Morrison, this is his resume. He shuts down Marvin Harrison Jr. So someone at Texas A&M is getting shut down Saturday night and not a single person on their board complained. You know, that would have like exploded North Carolina's board if I said Benjamin Morrison was good. Nobody, they're all like, yeah, that guy, I mean, people know, BMO at this point, he is shutting people down this year. And then you got to go to Christian Gray. I think for me, probably um, most impressive is the offensive line, because I thought if Notre Dame lost this game, it would be at the hands and feet of the offensive line. And, and instead that offensive line was part of Notre Dame dominating the fourth quarter to end up winning this game by 10 points. So um, I had really high expectations for the secondary. I think that um, Ben Morrison is a 2025 first round draft pick. And I think Christian Gray has potential and is arcing tracing toward being a 2026 first round NFL draft pick. Um, So for me, most pleasantly surprised at the performance of the offensive line. If I'm having to pick disappointment, it's a little bit nitpicky. Um, and it was his first ever game of American college football, but maybe the punt game. I mean, he still averaged 42.8 yards per punt, but but he didn't uncork one of those that made us all gasp in the press box and say, wow, there's that that James Rendell leg strength that we saw a time or two in preseason camp. And he'll get there. I don't have any doubt in that. And again, that's completely nitpicking because the question was ask us to pick. Uh, I would say – I would go offensive line, uh, but just to be different, I'll go offensive coordinator. Um, I thought that Mike Denbrock had a very good plan that fit into what Notre Dame was trying to accomplish and win the game the, exactly the way that they ended up winning it. Uh, I thought the tight ends struggled. Uh, that 
Eli Raider and Cooper Flanagan looked just like they weren't completely sure of what they were seeing, uh, especially in the run game. So uh, Mitchell Evans, I'm not sure that we expected him to play a ton more than he actually did, but uh, there's they need a lot of growth from Raritan and Flanagan in the run game, I think, for the the whole run game to to be what it can be. Yeah, I agree with that, Pete. And Tim, to your point about Ben, uh, ben Morrison, it, I think quintessential Ben Morrison was the streak that uh, Cyrus Allen, the kid from Louisiana Tech who came in with huge numbers, uh, he, he ran the go route and Morrison just like textbook inside yeah, it's not. inside position, running with him, turns at the right time. It was just, uh, it, it was textbook. JB, as far as Rendell is concerned, I, I hear you. I'm not sure it's how much prettier it's going to get, but here's the big disadvantage and we've talked about this a little bit, but he had what five or six punts. Uh, every one of okay, every one of them looks different to the punt returner. Yeah, <laughs> no two are alike. You don't know what's going to come from him, and he doesn't. You know, he kind of punches the ball. American football, you're you're used to that high leg follow through. That's not what. That's not the game that he played. Now I know he studied and practiced to be an American punter, but he's not, the, the technique is not, is not there, but I just thought it was kind of funny that, you know, as you're, so you're Northern Illinois and you're trying to, you're trying to scout and, and determine how the ball's going to arrive off of, off of James Randell's foot. Who the hell knows? Everyone's different from one to the next. Yeah. And he still averaged 43 yards on five punts and, and dropped at least one inside the 20, maybe two. He, he put three, in, he put three. One, inside the 20. one was returned and it was a soft yeah. liner, which he can't do that. Terry Bussey scared me all night. So, I mean, it was a soft liner that he was able to come up on and he returned at 18 yards. The other five weren't returned. And ultimately it comes down to, you know, net yards. I'm not sure what it was. If you figure in the 18 yard or before the five weren't returned, I think it was only 10, but yeah, uh, it was a 10, yeah. was it was a 10, 10 yard return. Okay. From the eight return. to the 18, it was 10 right. yards from the eight. That's to where the I eight. got the 18. Well, fair um, enough. So it was pretty good. This one is for, and also guys on punting, they can't all be John Sott. We know that this question is kind of pointed at Tim Priester, K Garrity eight. You said you needed to see it with Drake Bowen Saturday. What are your thoughts on him after watching his first performance for ND and against an SEC opponent? I, I thought he did a great job. Great job. You guys go ahead and chime in. I mean, to me, you're not going to make every play. He's going to be so much better after that game, and I thought he was really, really nice in that game. And it'll stick to me the way that he attacked the line, shed a blocker. I can't remember if he got off the block of the center or the guard, but then also still made the tackle, um, again, right at or six inches behind the line of scrimmage, I thought – um, I had nice expectations for Drake Bowen. I thought he um, provided a very strong foundation game one for the rest of this season. Yeah. I mean, hit, he is a hitter bumper. Like if when they run into teams like AM that really want to pound the ball, maybe some two back stuff, like a block destructor, I guess is probably to use old Bob Diaco isms there, but oh, uh, yeah, there you yeah. go. Get, get him in the show. So yeah, I, I thought it was a, a Solid, solid game for Drake Bowen. Uh, I have my thoughts. Right when you guys, JB and Pete, you both said something that reminded me of the same guy. JB, you said he's going to get a lot better from game one to game two because Notre Dame's first time starting middle linebacker in 2019 was not good, and then he was great the whole rest of the year. Pete Sampson, block destructor, perfect for the task. He is like a bigger, more athletic Drew White. Yeah. Mm. He okay. absolutely attacks that hole with the intentions yeah. of hurting something. And at some point when that's why the KVA might, maybe when they're playing a team that goes hor that, that goes horizontally more, they'll see more KVA or you'll see, you'll see Jack Kaiser in the middle and you'll see Jaden Osbury on the weak side and Jalen Steed in the game at Rover, but he attacks and drew white. When you watch his film before he was hurt many, many times, cause he's so small. He had 43 stuffs in 2019. And I know he didn't have too many against Louisville cause he didn't play that well, either him or Bilal. No one's come close to that since. 43 run stuffs. Nobody comes close to that. And he was a two down player. That's incredible. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, it's still, it's going to be very hard to keep KV off the field because he just, <laughs> his skill set is just so great. I said, I, I mean, I, K Garrett, he ate, I just quickly summarized because I talked about it in the first segment. Mm -hmm. uh, I said he played great. I said, I, let me say, he played very well for his first start. He did a lot of really, really good things, did Drake Bowen. We have a question from uh, 
get that Irish, which freshman didn't play in the rotation at Texas A&M due to the environment at Kyle Field that you expect we will see on the field in the first half against Northern Illinois? We haven't talked about Jordan Faison's injury. He's going to be out for uh, at least a couple weeks. Um, Tim, go ahead and jump in there as far as how that applies. Yeah, because Marcus Freeman. Now, K.K. Smith will replace him in the in the depth chart. He is an X. Micah Gilbert's a W, but Marcus Freeman said we will probably see Micah Gilbert as well. You hope you see more players because – that's the method, right? You play Texas A&M, you play Clemson, you play Ohio State, you don't play as many guys. You're going you're gonna to see a lot of guys against Northern Illinois. Um, Bryce Young will play more. Did he get a play or two? I think PFF might he have did, had him with a play. He did. Uh, he, was in, he was in goal line. Oh, that's right. And he plays yeah. special mm-hmm. teams because he blocks for a yep. little block and yep. stuff. Um, but, but Bryce Young would have a greater role. Um, Aeneas Williams will, would definitely play, I believe, definitely. on Saturday as well. Yeah, maybe, maybe a Carson Hobbs. Why? You know, I mean, if the game gets – a little bit one-sided, maybe a Carson Hobbs. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Carson Hobbs. Yeah, Leonard Moore. Yeah. Yep, Leonard yeah. Moore played. But, uh, well, he, you know. yeah, he played. Um, yeah, but yeah, he's he got not in the, in the rotation. Right. You know, like, right, right, right. I would think no, that was Moore when would, that, Yeah, I but, think that was when Morrison went to the locker room and, and, uh, and, and um, you know, they put, they put more in there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully you're going to see quite a few more guys here. To celebrate Notre Dame's 23-13 victory over Texas A&M, ESQ is offering a one-week-only discount of 23% off everything online, exclusive to Irish Illustrated listeners. ESQ's proprietary bamboo shirt has been seen on all your favorite players and coaches, and it's the perfect performance dress shirt for any occasion. It's softer and cooler than cotton, odor-resistant, wrinkle-resistant, and even machine-washable. Go to esqclothing.com and con con com and use code WIN to get 23% off your order. Reminder, this promo will end before next Saturday's kickoff. So get your perfect fit today. That's esqclothing.com. Easy for me to say. Our I'm typing question. the web address in. It doesn't fit in the field. <laughs> the way it won't click. Huh? There's something. <laughs> the uh, next question is from Munchkins99. Where was RJ Oben? Who will provide edge pressure in this defense? I uh, what is left out here is apparently RJ Oven has left football because yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's was... it's it's still a little bit early in the season. I think he <laughs> RJ Oven could be that guy, but I do want to say he was bad Saturday night. He did not play well. He did he look he didn't look comfortable. He looked like he was running in sand or mud at times. He was pushed off the play by a lot. I don't know what was going on there. We know RJ Oban's a better football player than that, but I, in rewatching the game, did not see anything of anything positive from his performance against Texas A&M. Uh, Thirty-one snaps, and if you do all the snaps, basically every they played twenty-one guys, thirty-one snaps. Nobody has all zeros across every humanly possible statistical category that PFF tracks, except for RJ open like Leonard Moore. What did Leonard Moore do? He has a number in here. He had an assisted tackle. So 31 snaps, which is 10th on the team tied with, um, excuse me, 12th on the team tied with Jalen Sneed. Think of what Jalen Sneed did with his 31 snaps. I did. I was surprised it was 31 snaps, frankly. So if there's 31, I'm sure I missed. Mm-hmm. He did have right, a tap. Right. You don't you can't watch memory play, but he did not yeah. record any type of statistic or open. Open zero. He had, an, he had a I'm sorry to contradict you here, Tim, but I see an assisted tackle. But not according like, to the pro was, football focus. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, uh, it's here on the here on the uh, stat sheet. But uh yeah, I you know, I don't know. He's way better player than that. Uh he just did not, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the moment, very, the moment wasn't too big for just about every Nordane player. You, you can't expect a hundred percent of that. Maybe it, it, it was for him. But I think he's a better football player than that. And I, we've seen him pass rush against good football teams. I'm going to sure say maybe quite, need Blake Fisher out there to get himself I, I, going. I, <laughs> I'm sure he's quite <laughs> capable uh, of that. Who did you guys, or what did you see of, of Oban? Did I miss yeah, something I think- there? I, I thought I remember the play that he helped make a tackle. PFF may may not be crediting it. I do remember uh, he helped get off a block and helped finish off uh, a tackle. Um, I don't think it's time to push the panic button with him yet. But um, if you're Notre Dame, you want to see uh, a marked stride forward right. next weekend right. against NIU. 
I believe in RJ Oban. He just didn't play well Saturday night. Question from Ever2XL. What do you think was the difference between what you saw on film with Connor Wigman's past that caused po the podcast to talk him up so much and the QB showed up for the QB that showed up for Texas A&M Saturday? That was that was not the Connor Wigman that I've seen. I realize that Notre Dame has a great defense and they exposed him, but he was awful. Well, I think what for me, what stood out is Al Golden. Uh, again, okay. credit to Pete. Um, and and we had said I, I felt like Notre Dame won the headset matchup. So number one, Al Golden stood out. He made Connor Wegman really uncomfortable. The same way he made C.J. Stroud uncomfortable a couple of years ago in Columbus, and has made other uh, quarterbacks like Caleb Williams really uncomfortable. The other thing is, um, I'll continue to. Uh, emphasize this. I think Notre Dame has its most SEC like defense that it's had certainly since I've been around, which is not very long at all. But um, even following college football, it's the most SEC like defense that Notre Dame has had in a really long time. And that's why I think Connor Wegman will have better games, but Connor Wegman is not done struggling this year. I thought that uh, it gave a nod to the Leonard Dunbrock combination, like hitting the ground running and having a plan that works for both is not automatic. Um, I don't think you can just assume that. And I thought that Colin Klein and Connor Wegman just did not, did not sync up very well at Saturday night um, in terms of the decisions Wegman made. I don't think he's, I think he's a lumbering runner, not uh, a dynamic runner. I think if you're Colin Klein, like somebody, you know, Will Howard is a big guy too. Avery Johnson is probably the guy that Colin Klein's looking for as his next quarterback. And Connor Wegman's just, he's just not, he's a different style of quarterback um, than that. So first game for both of them together, uh, didn't go very well. Al Golden had a ton to do with that. I would, I would think they would get better, but um, you know, I, I think it just goes to show like your new coordinator, new quarterback, that's not always going to hit the ground running. 11 months out for Connor Wegman as well. He hadn't played just like just like Riley Leonard, so that, yeah, that I can't help you. Ben Morrison, that, that's that's the best secondary Connor Wegman's going to see. That's an incredible thing to say. Yeah, and he considering you know, where he plays. I mean, he made some bad throws when he wasn't pressured, and yeah. and and maybe a lot of that had to do with the coverage that he saw downfield. I, you know, I mean, he's going against a really good secondary. I want to say that there are times, and Tim, you'll we'll track this on PFF, but uh, Bubukar Traore is probably not is not going to get the number of quarterback pressures that he deserves that he gets sh should get credit for. Uh, they only give right the NSA only gives out one per per snap. Uh, but he is he is going to be around the quarterback a lot this year. And I thought that there were occasions where he was in he was in Wigman's head a little bit, but Wigman was bad. Uh, I'm not sure how, how you know great a shape he's in. We had heard stuff about that. He's getting sick on the field. That can happen to anybody. I realize that, but it happened to their quarterback. So something happened to that... Daniel Cage. It can happen to Connor Wegman. It's fine. <laughs> that, that, that okay? KJ Rice, a huge factor in Indy's strong fourth quarter finish appeared to be better conditioned than the opponent. Aggies players suffered a number of cramps and injuries. Meanwhile, with the notable exception of Faison, Indy escaped a hard-fought physical game rel relatively unscathed. Did Indy's conditioning advantage and road hostile environment surprise you? But most important, since we have touched on this already, who deserves the credit for this valuable advantage? Yeah, well, we talked about Lauren Lando, and yeah, yeah, it did surprise me, especially when you compare it to to Texas A and M. It, it, it is. Uh, I had obviously had a lot of doubts. I said Marcus Freeman and his team have to prove it. They proved it, man. They proved it. Now, <laughs> the next step <laughs> is being ready for Northern Illinois, which is going to be very difficult because of what you went through, uh, everything that you had to handle, bouncing back. They've got to find a way to, you know, recompose themselves. And 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 that's, I guess that's now the next step in the evolution of, of Marcus Freeman's development as a head coach. But all the credit in the world to him. He had his team ready to play. They were in great condition. They handled it all great. I was I was wrong about my prediction. Great, great credit to Marcus Freeman. Last question leads us into the rest of the week. Terry Benedict, is it strange to you that in Marcus Freeman's post-game presser, he didn't know who they are playing this weekend? <laughs> I think he I think he, I think he I think he I knew think who he, they were playing. I think he has grouped 
Miami, Ohio, and, and uh, like their, your future scouts, Miami, Ohio, Northern Illinois, a little bit of Purdue in one big group, and he was exhausted, Probably. and that's what he just. And when he, when he he and he was exhausted, he said it as yeah. soon as he sat down. And but when he said that, I don't even know who he play. I figured it would click in his head that <laughs> yes. he better say something about Northern <laughs> Illinois, not to piss him off. Right, <laughs> and he uh, did. So he I must have that, really been exhausted. I think it showed. I, I don't. I'm. I'm not convinced it wasn't intentional. I think it showed how much he's telling his team live for the moment. You get 12 guaranteed opportunities. This past Saturday was about uh, the opportunity at Texas A&M. Period. I don't think he knew. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> I think he's so exhausted. Like he just. He just he didn't really, have it. No, he, he it really out, did yeah. look when he said it. He really. I mean, he looked like at wit's end. Man, I've got give it every. I, I I can't even think about I can't even think of who Northern Illinois is. Or... I'm sure he I, I'm sure the advanced <laughs> scouting has done their job. And Marcus Freeman began looking at Northern Illinois right around when he woke up this morning as yeah. or at the end of last night's film yeah. review of Ohio State. Yeah. I mean, he probably didn't know who they played last year, Tennessee State, and they killed him. Probably didn't know who they played the year before. Marshall, it worked out fine. It's you don't need to know your second game when you're playing one. <laughs> Well, we'll be, we'll be back on Thursday. to tie. I normally um, have an opportunity to watch the next opponent late on Sunday night. I had to cash it in after watching the replay of the Notre Dame game. So I'm a, I'm a little like bit over to USC the... and LSU probably too. Yeah. You have that going on. There's yeah, stuff. a little yeah. bit, a little bit. Uh, so I've got a little bit to catch up, but we'll talk about Northern Illinois a little bit more on Thursday. And I want to remind everybody, those that, uh, that like our, our podcast and our NHTSA analysis, analysis, you can find much more if you subscribe to irisillustrated.com until Thursday. I'm Tim Priester with Tim O'Malley from Irish Illustrated, John Bryce of the Football Scoop, and Pete Sampson of The Athletic. This has been Irish Illustrated Insider.